So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our June Lunch and Learn, um, T. Thomas Fortune and the Art of Social Justice, which will be led by Hilda Rogers. Um, my name is Spencer Cronin, and I am the Program Manager at Change, the Center for Holocaust, Human Rights, and Genocide Education at Brookdale Community College. Um, before we continue, I do want to note that our center is housed on the occupied territory of the Lenape people. So for those of you who are new to Change, welcome. Our center has worked now for the past 42 years to promote the elimination of anti-Semitism, racism, and all forms of prejudice through innovative education about the Holocaust, other instances of genocide, and human rights. Um, it's been more than a year now since we transitioned to virtual programming last March, um, but thanks to your support, our center has provided more than 50 public-facing programs that have now reached over 55,000 people across six continents, which is incredible. Um, this programming occurs because of the generosity of our members and program participants like you. Um, please consider joining Change as a member if you are not already and signing up for more information about future programming. Um, you can do all of this by visiting our website, which is change.org. That's change with two H's. After the session, you will receive an email with additional resources, um, as well as a link to view the recording of this session. So a couple of housekeeping items before we get started. Um, your audio will remain muted throughout the program, but the chat feature is enabled. So please feel free to use that to communicate with one another. Um, we will have time for questions and answers at the end of the presentation. Um, so if you have a question at any point throughout, please, please feel free to type it in that chat box um, and we will get to as many as we can after the talk. So before I introduce our speaker, I'd just like to thank Change staff, Ali Evans, and our executive director, Dr. Sarah Brown, for helping with today's program. And it is now my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Ms. Gilda Rogers. Gilda Rogers is an award-winning journalist, author, playwright, and educator. She is the co-chairwoman of the T. Thomas Fortune Foundation Board and led the grassroots organization effort to save and preserve the T. Thomas Fortune House, a national historic landmark. Gilda was named the Humanitarian of the Year in 2017 by the Monmouth County Human Relations Commission. The American Association of University Women named Gilda one of their honorees for its first ever Women of Achievement Award in 2018. She teaches history as an adjunct professor at Brookdale Community College, and she is also an award-winning journalist and author of three books. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Gilda Rogers. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Namaste. Um, thank you all for having me. The divine in me recognizes and salutes the divine in you. And I'm glad that all of you could be here with me today to hear and learn some information about probably a person more than likely you've not heard of, T. Thomas Fortune, and what we say He's the most famous person that no one has ever heard of. So I'm honored to be able to be here with all of you to share this information about a person who um, contributed to the society in a way that would um, eventually lead to his home in Red Bank being designated as a National Historic Landmark. I'm going to share my screen because I... Um, put together a PowerPoint so that you can get to see, if you've never been to the Cultural Center, I invite you to come, but you'll get to see uh, the house and some of the artwork and things there that we're doing. All right, so here we go. Uh, let me make it into a slideshow. All right. I had this all down before now. Okay. No worries. If you go over, it's on the top right there, slideshow. I think this A thing is more covering right. it. Um, oh, the share. Oh, here thing. I see. I have there it. There we go. I have it now. Beautiful. Um, from the beginning. Okay. We're awesome. good. All right. <laughs> We're good. So this is called a social justice crusader. Um T. Thomas Fortune in Red Bank, From Failure uh, to Fortune. So, oh, God, why is it not going? See, these things happen. Why is it? Okay. 
You can Good. either try maybe clicking yeah, on the said, slide. It's saying my screen share is paused. Hmm. Hold on. Let me investigate that. Yeah. Um, so it won't let me click down to the next slide. Try the arrow keys on your keyboard. That's always a fun one. Yeah, I did. That's what I'm using. Oh, interesting. Um, let me see here. Wait, well, maybe it says resume share. Let me see. Yeah, there we go. Will... Let and me then maybe see. if we take it back to the slideshow again, um, we'll see. Bear with us. <laughs> so we're in the world of technology. The blessing and a curse. Yeah. I don't know why. It's... And we prepared. We went. We did. And... <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm hitting from the beginning. And it's not. Megan is helping us out here. Says you have to click like resume. The top left, there's a um, resume slideshow option. Um, right next to where it says A social justice. Um, oh, okay. You just pause for it. Yeah. So if you resume that, hopefully okay. it should work. Okay. There you go. Woo! There you go. <laughs> all right. Well done, everyone. <laughs> thank you, everyone, for your help. Thank you all so yeah, much. Thank you for being patient. Okay. So this. Let's take a look on the inside of the T. Thomas Fortune Cultural Center. So that's what you're looking at right now. Um, the, the room to the left is what we have designated as the Ida B. Wells Gallery. And the room on my right is the T. Thomas Fortune Gallery. Now, this home, um, like I said, was the former home of T. Thomas Fortune, who was a, a, a very uh, prominent journalist in the 19th, uh, late 19th, early 20th century. This home um, was going to be demolished, all right? Um, so Roger Mumford is a person that got involved. I wanna tell you a little bit about the house. It's the 1850s circa Victorian Second Empire home with a mansard, French mansard roof. Um, the door to the house and the stairway, the staircase in the house are original to the house. They were taken out of the house and sent out to be restored. This overhang that you see in the bay window area there with the corbels are, um, is original to the house as well. Many people think the floors are original to the house, but they're not. The floors were replicated and uh, the same person who restored the front door, who, who restored the um, staircase was the man who um, laid, cut and laid the floors. And they are always a novel talking point when people come to the cultural center. The house was severely damaged. A lot of things could not be saved, but we were able to replicate uh, the moldings that were there around the door and windows to the exact of what it was um, prior to, you know, when Fortune lived there, all right? So I'm going to... Oh, why is my, oh, here we go again. The arrow's not working. Oh, I don't know why. Yeah, maybe try just resharing again, see if we can't reset it. I'm gonna, okay, okay, seems to be going, okay. So the mission of the T. Thomas Fortune Cultural Center is to uphold, can everybody see this? No, so it sounds like you just have to reshare again. Okay, I'm sorry. Oh no worries at all. <laughs> this is, is, I'm so sorry. Why is this going like this? Share screen. Okay. See it now? Yes. All right, I, I'm just gonna leave it like this. I'm yeah, I think to to better the, safe than sorry. I'm not gonna try to do the slideshow deal. No worries. Um, okay. Okay, so um, the mission of the T. Thomas Fortune Cultural Center is to uphold the civil rights and social justice legacy of T. Thomas Fortune through education, history, community engagement, the arts and public programming. The, the, the artwork that you see on the screen now, the art that's to, to my left 
It's called Social Justice Crusaders, Past, Present, and Future by Lavette Ballard. These are pieces that we have commissioned artists to do for us. This one particular piece by Lavette Ballard is a signature piece in the Cultural Center. It's done on, she uses parts of fences to create her artwork on. And it's be, like the floors, this has become a novel uh, piece at the Cultural Center, which people, when they come, it's pretty big. They stand, they wanna take pictures by it. And we sell posters that match this piece of art. Next, you'll see a, another piece of art by um, Julia Rivera. And it, the young little girl with her hand up that says enough. I was just uh, bowled over by it. Thought it, you know, that one word said it all, particularly in this time that we're living through, that enough is enough. And so this is another commission piece that you'll see at the cultural center when you come. And then the last piece to the right is um, a compilation or a uh, um, rendering of many of the Harlem Renaissance writers, a collage that was created for us by Alan Burgess um, for our um, Count Basie exhibit. And so this is our Count Basie exhibit. If you come to the Cultural Center now, a love letter to Count Basie from the Great Migration to the Harlem Renaissance and that collage by Alan Burgess is a part of this exhibit. Uh, what you see here on the screen now, um, I was the curator of this exhibit and it allowed me, Count Basie allowed me to tell the story of the Great Migration as well as the Harlem Renaissance because Count Basie's parents are part of the Great Migration and they came to Red Bank at the turn of the 20th century. And Count Basie is a part of the Harlem Renaissance. So through his illustrious career, I was able to get into telling those two stories. And um, it was a partnership between the Institute of Jazz Studies at Rutgers University in Newark. If you see here in the curio on the right side in that um, um, image, you'll see in that curio, uh, hopefully you can make it out. It's the captain's hat, Count Basie's hat and shoes. And there's some other items in there that were personal items of Count Basie's that the Institute of Jazz Studies lent to us for our exhibit. They're no longer there now because we had to return them, uh, but people you know, got a real um, charge out of really seeing uh, those items of Count Basie's. So the journey, my journey to T. Thomas Fortune. T. Thomas Fortune, like I said, he was a stalwart when it comes to, when it comes to social justice and journalism. I am a journalist. My undergraduate degree is in journalism. And I did not learn anything about T. Thomas Fortune when I was studying to become a journalist. And him being one of the most prominent journalists, African-American journalists of the late 19th and early 20th century factors into why I said he's one of the most famous person you never heard of, all right? And one of his quotes was is that, I believe in the divine right of man, not of caste or class. These were the words that T. Thomas Fortune delivered in a speech titled, The Present Relations of Labor and Capital on April 20th, 1886, before the Literary Union in Brooklyn, New York. He was 30 years old. Fortune, was born into slavery in 1856 in Mariana, Florida. Um, he became this social justice crusader as a result, obviously, of the dehumanization 
of African-American people being enslaved and during reconstruction, his father, Emmanuel Fortune was elected to the Florida assembly. So at 13 years old, T. Thomas Fortune worked as a Senate page. And that work and being so close to the political happenings, and he was only 13 years old, and we know at 13, that's a very impressionable age. He took all of what he was hearing, the nefarious workings of white politicians in regard to African-American people. And this becomes his life's work, all right? He wrote a book, Black and White, Land, Land Labor and Politics in the South in 1880 at the age of 24 along with over 300 editorials about the injustices of African-Americans and what we faced in this country. He has been credited with being called the bridge to the modern day civil rights movement. And that is because Fortune in 1887, he established, he was the founding member of what was called the National Afro-American League, all right? Now the National Afro-American League is a precursor to the Niagara Movement, which out of the Niagara Movement comes the NAACP. Fortune was an organizer, all right? He um, was a, like I said, a astute writer, thinker, journalist, and he on some level was an economist. He understood the dynamics and that was the purpose of his book, Black and White Land, Labor and Politics in the South, urging that black and white people come together for economic parity for both races. Um, when um, he had his newspaper, the New York Age here, which started as, the New York Globe, then the name was changed to the New York Freeman, and then the last name was the New York Age. The New York Age newspaper was one of the most prominent African-American weekly newspapers in the country at that time. It is said to have even rivaled the New York Times. Fortune not only had correspondence in the United States, but he also had correspondence internationally. And when we think of somebody putting together a newspaper now, you know, we have computers and, you know, all of the technology to get this done, you know, I don't wanna say in a relatively short time, but considering what Fortune was dealing with as a newspaper publisher and editor, having to set type, all right, Ed editing, he had a task before him that he was committed to for all of, basically all of his life, all right? So that paper he used as a bully pulpit to talk about the um, injustices that African-American people were faced with in this country. Uh, he lambasted the failure of reconstruction when Ida B. Wells' uh, newspaper was burned to the ground um, because of her anti-lynching campaign, Fortune invited her to come to New York to work with him at his newspaper. He actually lived in New York in Brooklyn for 24 years before coming to Red Bank and purchasing this home that he called Maple Hall. And this is what the home looked like in 1976, when it was nominated to the United States Department of Interior um, to be um, hopefully accepted as a National Historic Landmark during the country's bicentennial. And it was, it was. And it has, you know, retained that National Historic status. And that's why to me, it was important to save this home because for one, 
It is only one of two national historic landmarks in the state of New Jersey that is devoted to African-American heritage. I'm gonna say that again. It is only one of two national historic landmarks in the state of New Jersey that is devoted to African-American heritage. That is not to say that there are not other sites that are on the national registry, but none carry the um, um, title of National Historic Landmark and in the world of preservation, that's at the top of the list. So that in itself tells us that Fortune had to be someone that was pretty prominent for this home to be designated as a National Historic Landmark that bears his name. All right, so now when I was introduced to the home, this is what it looked like. Probably even worse, this picture does not do it justice as to what shape this house was in when I started the campaign to try to save it. Um, the home had been in 1976, shortly after Fortune lived there. Let me back up. Shortly after Fortune and his family lived there from 1901 until approximately 1911. Uh, his son actually graduated from Red Bank High School. His son, Frederick Fortune, would go on to become a renowned OBGYN surgeon in uh, Philadelphia. Now, I just want you to take that in, that this was someone, the son of someone who was born into slavery. Uh, Fortune and his wife, Carrie, also had a daughter who was older, whose name was Jessie Fortune, and she would become a teacher. She never lived at this residence with her parents. Um, she lived in New York. She was older, than, I think like seven or eight years older than the son. And she was an adult by the time Fortune and his wife and Frederick moved into this house. After they lived there, uh, an Italian family moved into this house, the Baccarelli family, and they built a bakery on the back of the house. If you look to the rear, you'll see like this little addition that was like part of the bakery. And they are actually the family that signed off to have this home designated as a National Historic Landmark because obviously, fit, fort, I mean, in 1976, Fortune had been deceased since uh, June 2nd, 1928. So in our campaign, um, I was just about raising awareness about who Fortune is, why this home was important to be saved, and just trying to get the message out because um, obviously we needed to raise money in order to save the house. Uh, so we, in 2013, we had a symposium right at Brookdale Community College uh, that focused on um, T. Thomas Fortune and making preservation relevant. Um, the woman you see to my left, her name is Linda Shockley, and she's a member of the National um, um, National Black Journalist uh, Organization. And to the right, the late Les Payne, who's a Pulitzer Prize winner, I, we were honored to have him uh, at that um, symposium to speak um, about fortune. So these were some of the things that we were doing in our campaign to raise awareness about the home, about T. Thomas Fortune and the importance of saving it. In this campaign and during this time, we managed to get make it into the New York Times newspaper. As you see there, you see the top right there, you see the Fortune House um, and down to the bottom left, you see the, a building that is located in um, Montclair, which was preserved and saved, the OYWCA building. And so the New York Times did an article. It would have, we made it into the Sunday New York Times, as a matter of fact, on Father's Day it was, 
Um, so they juxtaposed what was happening in our situation with what had happened in Montclair and how Montclair was able to hold on to this building, preserve it and save it. And as a result of this article being in the New York Times is what drew Roger Mumford's attention. Roger, who um, was the developer of the T. Thomas Fortune Cultural Center. This is how I made my connection with him. It was through this newspaper article and him seeing these little yellow signs here put all around town that was saying, save the T. Thomas Fortune House. Okay. So in 2012, oh, why is, oh my God. In 2012, under the leadership, under my leadership, a, a diverse group of concerned citizens, we formed the T. Thomas Fortune Project Committee with the intent of educating the Red Bank community and beyond about the work of T. Thomas Fortune. In 2017, the group was granted nonprofit status by obtaining its 501c3 as a charitable organization. And in 2019, the T. Thomas Fortune Cultural Center opened to tremendous fanfare, only to close in 2020 um, because of the pandemic that and we're still why is this not going oh my goodness guys i'm so sorry my computer is not cooperating now here we go okay here so the t thomas fortune cultural center opened in may of 2019 only to close uh, in march of 2020 right before we would have celebrated our anniversary because of the pandemic. Um, here to my right, you see people gathered here on the front lawn of the Cultural Center. When we reopened in September of 2020 with our Count Basie exhibit, we did it in a very safe, socially distanced manner and everybody was fine. We brought uh, groups in, small groups, four or five at a time to see the exhibit. And we've been open since then. Um, we're open from one to five on the weekends. Now these are the apartment buildings that if you come to the uh, Fortune Cultural Center Collective, we call ourselves Fortune Square. Directly behind the Fortune Cultural Center are these apartments. In order for Roger to uh, underwrite what he did for us in deeding the Cultural Center to us for one dollar, I'm going to repeat that he rehabilitated and restored the Cultural Center and deeded it back to the T. Thomas Fortune Foundation for $1 and in order for, so we own and operate it. In order for him to do that, he had to build these um, apartment, build this apartment building in the back, which as you can see, mimics the facade of the cultural center with the mansard roof and the bay window area. This is an artist sketch of Maple Hall when we were coming up with ideas. So if you come to Maple Hall, there's two benches at the edge of the lawn that is close to the sidewalk. So people can just come there and relax and sit. And it's a little granite piece right in the middle that tells those who are sitting there who may, may not come into the cultural center something about T. Thomas Fortune. And these are just some of the aesthetics that you would find at the cultural center, the lighting. And this is my last slide. So I say fortune is alive and well in Red Bank, okay? Um, in the middle, you'll see that article Red Bank Register, from the Red Bank Register. This article appeared in the Red Bank Register 
August 1st, 1901. And I'm gonna read the headline. It says, Red Bank's new resident, T. Thomas Fortune, is one of the country's noted colored men. And what I told Allie and um, Spencer, I don't know about all of you, and I'm sure many of you have moved to various different places in your life. No one ever announced that I was moving or coming to a, a certain community. So this should give us again, some insight as to who this person is during this time in his life that he was somebody of some real prominence and relevancy. Fortune also started uh, what was called the National Afro-American Business and Investment Company. And that is how he was able to buy his home in Red Bank, which he dubbed Maple Square for $4,000 because African-American people certainly could not walk into a bank and get a loan for a mortgage. So he was cutting edge and progressive in what he was doing. He had no fear of politics and politicians. Many people who have seen Fortune when we were doing our campaign would say, oh, he looks like a white man. And that is because he's biracial. His father, his grandfather was the plantation owner, all right? Uh, but he fought all of his life to the day he died. His last, he, he uh, the newspaper, he sold in 1907. And the newspaper was still in existence up until 1960, the New York age. The newspaper actually had been, uh, uh, Booker T. Washington was the financier of the newspaper for a number of years. He and Fortune were uh, dear friends, but they had a falling out because Fortune, if you, if you know the ideology of, of Booker T. Washington and his conservative approach to African-American people uh, attaining you know, freedom and justice in America, Fortune went against that. Fortune is known as a militant uh, and Fortune and uh, Booker T. Washington had a falling out in 1903. And um, after that, Booker T. Washington no longer funded the newspaper and eventually Fortune had to sell the newspaper in 1907. However, his last job as an editor, he worked for Marcus Garvey's uh, newspaper, The Negro World. And he was the editor of that newspaper until, as a matter of fact, his last editorial ran in Marcus Garvey's Negro World newspaper on the day that Fortune died. So um, that ends my uh, presentation and I invite all of you to come and learn more about Fortune at the Cultural Center, I could go on and on about him. It's, it's a lot to share, uh, but I understand that um, there might be questions and comments and I'd love to be here to answer them and talk further about Fortune. All right, you. well, thank you so much, Gilda. We really, really appreciate it. That was such a, a fascinating um, I'm sorry about the, the, the technology oh, as much yes. as you practice. It much happens to all of us. I guarantee you there's not a person on here who hasn't had that happen in the, in the past, <laughs> however many months we've been through this. Um, so <laughs> Ali mentioned this, but if you have any more questions, feel free to put them in the chat. We'll get to as many as we can. Um, so my first question is more for you. So what brought you to this project? How did you hear about T. Thomas Fortune? What made you want to get involved with, you know, rescuing this house? Um, I know you're a journalist by trade, and so this is a little bit of a, of a different project. So I'd be curious to hear about that. Well, it really goes back. If you really want to know my connection with Fortune, it goes back to the year 2000 when I was first introduced to Fortune. I never knew, like I said in the beginning, I studied journalism. I never heard of them. I studied history. I never heard of them. Um, I worked as a, like Fortune, 
I was the editor of an African-American weekly newspaper in Newark. And that year we won the uh, T. Thomas Fortune Award for journalism from, uh, from the Garden State Association of Black Journalists, all right? I had no idea who Fortune was when we won that award. So I had to do a little research so that, you know, I could familiarize myself with who this person is that we're winning this award for, and I don't even know who he is. And so that is how it got started. And I was living in Red Bank. I didn't grow up in Red Bank. I grew up in Elizabeth, but by this time I am living in Red Bank in the mid nineties. Um, but at, like I said, and, and in 2000, I'm living in Red Bank, but I'm working in Newark. When I go back to school to study for my uh, master's degree in 2003, I think it was at Monmouth University, I ran across Fortune's name um, in research that I was doing over at the Schomburg Center for African American History and Study in New York. And it said, he lived in Red Bank in this, you know, research that I was doing. At the same time, the synergy, it all came together. It was synchronistic that a councilman from Red Bank and a man named George Bowden, who was the um, chairperson of the Red Bank Historical Commission approached me at the same time I learned that Fortune lived in Red Bank, they approached me to say, oh, Gilda, that house, that abandoned house there, do you know who lived there? And I'm like, T. Thomas Fortune. And it was like, it was like a revelation. It's like, I would ride by this house before I knew Fortune lived there. I saw it, you know, it was abandoned and no one had lived in the house since 2000 and since 2006, right? No one had lived there. Um, so I'm seeing this house going, that's a nice house. Probably was really something in its heyday. Never knowing that this home belonged to T. Thomas Fortune. And then one thing led to another. They told me about it. I, at the time, was a, had a bookstore in Red Bank called Frank Talk Art Bistro and Books. And in 2008, we I held the first T. Thomas Fortune birthday party on October 3rd at my bookstore. And that's how the campaign got going. Wow, that's fantastic. Um, this was, it, was divine, it was divinely orchestrated. There we go. Um, so shifting gears a little bit, um, one of the themes that I think has been running throughout this talk is this idea that no, not many people know who T. Thomas Fortune is, right? Um, and we have a comment from Wendy that says she has a friend who majored in journalism, um, was taught about I.W. Wells, um, but wasn't taught that she was Black. Um, and so we're, we're talking about this sort of, you know, invisibleness, this erasure of prominent African-American figures. Um, so could you talk a little bit about, you know, what's at the root of this and how, what do we do to, to bring these figures back into the, the mainstream where they belong? Um, I think, well, for me, I did this, all right? Mm -hmm. um, I think it's important that we, we seek to find out the history, the truth, basically the truth and those people behind it, all right? Ida B. Wells was not only a, um, a great journalist, Ida B. Wells also was very important to the suffragette movement, women getting the right to vote. And she fought tirelessly to um, have African-American women, because if you understand the suffragist movement, the white women of the suffragist movement did not want the black women to, to really be a part of it. And Ida B. Wells totally 
fought them tooth and nail on that and, you know, made a point that she was not taking a back seat to, you know, what they thought was the right way to go about women receiving uh, or, or attaining the right to vote. These hidden figures, because we have not been taught them in our education, I wasn't taught, you wasn't taught, all, many of these people on this Zoom session was not taught out the history of African-American people in this country. There were those cast of characters that we learned about who could make us feel good about this country, so to speak, or, or the ideals of this country, all right? But when we get down to the nitty gritty of it, the truth of those people like a T. Thomas Fortune was stifled. You know, anything that made the European narrative of history in this country um, to oppose that was more or less done away with. All right. So that's why I say to all African-American people, um, it's, it's, it's up to us to seek this history. It's up to us to bring it to the forefront. And it's up to all of us to understand the dynamic of what it means to be an American in this country and how that is also a fusion of maybe the good, the bad, not maybe, but a fusion of the good, the bad, and the ugly of this history so that we can move forward in a more, in a more harmonious manner as human beings and live up, to, live up to those ideals that supposedly this nation was founded on. So I don't know if I answered, but I hope that Thank you. Um, let's see here. A couple of questions coming in about T. Thomas Fortune himself. So the first one, um, do we know what brought him to Red Bank um, and why he ultimately left? I know he only spent sort of a fraction of his life there. Do we know anything about that? He came to Red Bank. The lure is that he came to Red Bank because he was looking for a home in the country. So that's what we've been told. Um, um, his stay here was short because after he lost his newspaper in 1907, he had a bout with alcoholism. He lost his marriage. His wife divorced him, you know? So he kind of, you know, falls out of grace, all right? And he takes up living in, um, he actually lived for a little while down near Trenton because he worked for the State Department of Trenton for a little while. I mean, like he was able to eke out a living for himself because he was known. He was mm -hmm. known in the industry as, 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 as this prominent journalist, but he also was known as somebody that was a rebel rouser too. So some people wanted to stay away from him as well, all right? But um, yeah, he was, um, his wife and son were there probably until about, I say like 1911, we have it that because his son graduated from Red Bank High School in 1910. So we know in 1910, they were still, Carrie Fortune and her, and her son and Fortune was still here in Red Bank. But then after that, you think that she was probably here until about 1911. And then she goes back to Brooklyn where they had lived for 24 years before they came to Red Bank. Um, uh, Wendy, I don't know if it was, I'm sure it was depression um, and carrying the weight of African-American world on his shoulders. 
and trying to uh, get society to understand the importance of it, it living up to its creed. That was his mission. That that was his that was his mission. So I'm sure when he lost his newspaper, depression set in, alcoholism set in, and he just tumbled out of um, of existence, so to speak. So you mentioned um, about his a couple of his children. So you know, you said one of them went on to be um, a prominent physician. Another one was a teacher. Do we know anything about his descendants? If he has any descendants around today, are they involved with the cultural center? So do we know what happened there? Okay. So the last, his granddaughter, and and when we we were trying to make contact with his granddaughter, her name was Elizabeth Bowser. And she lived in Sag Harbor because the fortunes used to vacation in Sag Harbor, even when they lived here in Red Bank because Carrie Fortune, who had been born into slavery too, she was uh, his high school, not high school, she was his childhood sweetheart. At the age of 16, a white captain, ship captain took her to Sag Harbor to be the seamstress for his wife. So Carrie Fortune lived in Sag Harbor for a, a while um, and became, you know, some, you know, known there. In, in 1878, Fortune comes to Sag Harbor and he marries Carrie Fortune. All right. And um, I don't even know, I'm, I'm getting losing track. Um, of the question. Um, he marries Carrie Fortune and then um, they settle in Brooklyn. They settle in Brooklyn where they live there until, and his, so his one, one, descendant, one descendant that we knew about, Elizabeth Bowser, in 2015, she died at 95 years old. We were trying to make contact with her. We had been in touch with the historical society up in Sag Harbor right before she died, trying to make that connection. But she died in December in 2015, and we never made that connection. He does have a, some descendant, a descendant, which I think is the great granddaughter of his son, who lives actually in New Jersey, and we have reached out to her, but. She has no interest. We've sent her letters. I've talked to her on the phone. No, no interest in knowing about the cultural center or being a part of it. Well, thank you. Well, so shifting gears to talk a little bit more about the cultural center, um, could you tell us a little bit more about the kind of programming you have going on there? I know you all have been open now since I believe it was August of this past year. Um, and I know you have some really exciting events coming up, your Juneteenth event. Um, so could you tell us a little bit more about your, your programming? Okay, so yeah, so um, our programming all has to do with education, community outreach, public programming. We utilize the arts. Obviously, Fortune was a writer. Um, so one of the programs I like to talk about right now is our Juneteenth event that will be happening this Saturday. And we're opening in a new exhibit called The Fabric of Our Lives, a cultural textile experience. And that will involve um, a group of two women who go by the names of storytellers in cloth, who are quilters, who will sh be showcasing a number of their quilts at the Cultural Center. And also we have some artifacts that you'll be surprised to see. And we have, the amaz an amazing variety of fabrics from all over the continent of Africa. This idea sprung from a, a map I saw of the continent of Africa and each country was identified by fabric. So I was like, wow, isn't that interesting? And we have so much fabric that people have donated to us 
that have gone to Africa and come back. So I just thought this would be a great opportunity for people to learn about where these various different fabrics originate from, which they might have heard of, mud cloth, kinty cloth, the uh, batiks and all of that, and the history behind them all. And to even take it a step further, how when we talk about Afrofuturism, and that's about seeing the world or seeing the world through the prism of blackness, all right? Not isolating ourselves from it, but embracing it. So when you come to the cultural center, you'll see that a number of our furnishings of, of furniture, chairs um, are covered or have been reupholstered in African um, aesthetics and fabrics. Uh, and people always are like, wow, that's so beautiful. And, you know, so I'm like, you know, it's for everybody. It's not just for black people to like, it's for everybody to like. And when we can stop, you know, this is just for black people, or this is just for white people and come together and enjoy it all. All right. So that's what the Juneteenth will, Dr. Grayson, who was our founding president, will be talking about, he will kick off the event with a talk about Juneteenth. For those that who might not know Dr. Grayson, he's a, a history professor and prominent person in the community um, at Monmouth University. Um, so he'll be talking about Juneteenth and the significance and all of that. Then we'll open up the cultural center to those that want to come in and to see exhibit, we ask for a $10 donation. Also, we'll be showing a video by an, a fabric artist named Bisa Butler. Bisa Butler's work uh, can be seen now at the uh, Institute of Art Institute of Chicago. She's actually from New Jersey. She used to teach art in New Jersey. And now she's just this incredible fabric artist that, you know, I guess not unless you're wealthy, you could afford something by her now. But the storytellers in cloth will be talking about Bisa Butler because Bisa Butler was actually their first teaching, teaching um, assistant when they started to do their um, retreats for quilters. They've been doing a retreat for quilters uh, since uh, for the last 25 years. And Bisa Butler was one of the first teaching artists that came through their retreat. So they know her, they knew her, they knew her when. <laughs> we know her now. And so we're gonna be showcasing a video of hers to let people see just an amazing artist she is and the community of quilters, and the artistry behind that and the fabrics, I think will make for a very educational um, exhibit for adults and children alike. No, that sounds absolutely fantastic. Um, and for those of you that are with us right now, um, we will be sending out a follow-up email after the program that'll have a list of resources. And one of them will be the website for the T. Thomas Fortune uh, Cultural Center, which is recently re redone. It looks fantastic. Um, and you'll be able to connect with them on there to learn more about this exhibit, their Juneteenth event, um, all of their, their upcoming programs and events, which look just really, really wonderful. Um, so I think that is all the time that we have. So thank you all so much for being with us. Um, thank you, Gilda, for, for your time, for being here, for sharing your wisdom with us. Um, we really, really appreciate it. Um, feel free to check out our website, change.org. Again, that's change with two H's for more of our upcoming programs and events. Um, and with that, be well, take care, and we will see you soon. <laughs>